I would also like to thank everybody to come on Friday and listen to theory talks. Um, I would like first also to uh, thank to all my uh, co-authors on this paper. I enjoyed very much writing it with you. Uh, but especially I would like to thank uh, the second author here, Peter Bodenheimer, who is somewhere in the audience, uh, not only for contributing for this paper, but for really being a great, wonderful colleague and mentor uh, for quite a few years now. So, okay. So our paper outline, it has an introduction, then we have formation models, we have core equation disk instability. Uh, we also discuss about uh, post-formation evolution and also interiors of both solar system and exosolar planets, but you're going to hear about it uh, today. So I will definitely concentrate on uh, giant planet formation models, but in particular the composition or the predicted uh, composition of, of each model. Um, so, if you are still not convinced, giant planets are extremely important, and there are different reasons for that. So, first of all, they really shape uh, planet, young planetary systems. We've learned it also yesterday. Uh, that's because they form very fast, uh, they have large masses, and they are responsible maybe for the uh, excitation of uh, small bodies and, and delivery of, of volatile materials toward uh, the inner solar system. Uh, the other thing is their composition. Since they have gas, they give us uh, constraints on the um, composition of protoplanetary disks. So that's also a, a reason to study those objects. Um, so uh, since um, the last few uh, Protostars and Planets uh, conferences, I would say um, a big difference that happened was that until about uh, 95, giant planet formation models, they tried to um, explain the giant planets in our own solar system. So basically Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus and Neptune. Uh, but that changed a lot, especially at the beginning of 2000s, when we had masses and radii of extrasolar giant planets. And there we realized that we really need to start modifying our models because we, we got many surprises. Um, and now we are really entering a time uh, in which we uh, try to characterize uh, extrasolar planets, and I think that's the reason uh, that it is so important to understand how can we link composition and internal structures of planets to their formation mechanism. Um, so let's uh, just have a quick look at the uh, solar system planets. Uh, so here we have uh, the two giant, gas giant planets and the icy planets. Uh, the take home message from this plot, uh, from this slide should be that in the solar system, giant planets exist at very relatively large radial distances. This is very different from the hot Jupiters that were observed or are observed. The mass is decreasing with radial distance. That also gives us some constraints uh, on formation models. Uh, but the metal enrichment, enrichment is actually increasing with radial distance. So that means that uh, Saturn actually has more metals uh, metal enrichment relatively to the Sun compared to Jupiter and Uranus and Neptune are much more metal rich. So that's something we need to uh, e explain. Uh, I think Jonathan will talk more about the internal structure, the core masses and, and heavy element enrichments. Um, so this was the, the, the picture until 95 approximately. Uh, and what did we learn from, uh, from exoplanets? Uh, so first of all, we, we know that there are many observed exosolar giant planets. So that means that uh, giant planet formation must be an efficient or relatively efficient mechanism. Although now we, 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 it seems that uh, they, they seem to be less common than uh, low mass or intermediate mass planets. Um, giant planets occurrence rate is changing. It's between 5 and 20 percent. In fact, the, the, the range could be slightly larger. But this is because there is a dependence on stellar mass and stellar metallicity, as we just heard from Gilles. Uh, so that's another thing we need to um, take into account. Uh, giant planets also exist at very small radial distances. Uh, usually when we do formation models, uh, it's not easy to, to form them there, so we all assume uh, or many of us assume uh, migration. Um, but as we just heard, giant planets also exist at very large radial distances, and this we've learned from direct imaging. Um, 
We also have disk observations, which is also quite helpful because that gives us constraints on the time scale that we have to form giant planets. So we need to form the planets before the disk disappears. So we have constraints on the on the on the total mass, uh, the total time we have uh, for for giant planet formation. We also have constraints on the disk masses, but uh, this is still not very uh, well known. But this is also something that enters the model because we need to assume something about the physical properties of the disk. Um, Another interesting thing is that transiting giant planets seems to have a large range of, of heavy elements uh, inside. So it's not that they all have very little or, or, or a lot. There is really a diversity in terms of composition. Uh, but uh, giant planets have also been observed around M dwarfs and st uh, metal poor stars, which is also something we need to be able to to explain. So uh, Gilles showed you uh, plots from the same paper, but this is just to summarize. So this is uh, stellar metallicity. This is from John Johnson et al. So this is uh, basically uh, planet fraction, so occurrence. Uh, and you can see that this is definitely increasing with uh, stellar metallicity, but there is also uh, dependence on, on mass. So this is the red. So you can see that the red fits better than the blue. Uh, and this is because when you consider the dependence on mass, then you get a very nice fit to observations. Uh, there is also the planet metallicity, uh, stellar metallicity correlation, which is different from the uh, occurrence rate. And this is that if you look at the uh, metallicity of the star and the heavy element mass inside the giant planet, this is based on models, but you see that it increases with stellar metallicity. So this is from Guillot, 2006. Uh, there was a very nice study by Miller and Fortney in 2011. Uh, they took planets which are not very strongly radiated, which helps you, or, or you then you can constrain the uh, heavy element mass better, and you can see the same, the same trend. Okay, so that's something we also need to consider. Um, just a word of caution here, uh, the determination of stellar metallicity is a complex uh, process and, and we have to be a bit careful when we discuss metallicities of, of stars. Uh, data are still limited to strongly irradiated planets, so of course we are getting there, but uh, still the giant planets, the exosolar giant planets uh, we know of, they are still very close to their stars. So I would hope that uh, by PP7 we really have more Jupiter analogs. Um, and the last thing is that uh, this correlation uh, is found using models. So this is unlike the um, uh, occurrence rate correlation with stellar metallicity. This is based on models. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I think that uh, you should notice that it is in fact the planetary mass that is a better predictor for the enrichment. So there is much stronger um, correlation between planetary mass and metal enrichment uh, in, um, in extrasolar giant planets. So that means the, the lower the mass is, the more enriched the planet is. And this is very nice because it fits also what we see in the solar system. We, when we look at Uranus and Neptune, they are much more metal rich compared to uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Okay, so this you've just seen also from by, by Gilles. So this is the direct imaging planets. Now there is uh, there, there are updated uh, uh, pictures, but this is really to, to remind you that there are giant planets at very large radial distances, which is relatively recent uh, surprise for our formation models. Okay, so there are two giant uh, planet formation models. I'm sure by now you know, you've just heard about it. So the first one is core accretion, and the basic idea is that the formation of a giant planet uh, starts with coagulation of, of grains, followed by core formation, and eventually accretion of gas. Uh, the, um, at that state, the accretion is, is very um, efficient, and we form a, a, a gas giant planet. The second one is disk instability, and this is basically uh, gravitational instability within the protoplanetary disks. We also learned a lot uh, about this uh, this, uh, this week. And you can see these uh, very nice review papers from uh, Protostars and Planets uh, 5. Um, so here are just uh, 
uh, nice uh, pictures of this, these two models. So here you see uh, the core accretion model. So we start with accumulation of uh, small solid grains, and then we have a buildup of a core until eventually uh, we form a, a giant plant by um, gas accretion. And here we have uh, clump formation by gravitational instability. Uh, but for you uh, who were waiting for a very uh, strong debate on formation models, so uh, I'm not going to say which one one is right and which one is wrong, uh, but I'm going to um, tell you if we are open uh, that maybe both possibilities uh, still um, exist, uh, what uh, are the, let's say, advantages and disadvantages uh, of each model, but more importantly, how, how, does that, how can we correlate them with, with um, uh, composition? Okay, so just summarizing the core accretion quickly. So there are three main stages in the formation of a giant planet. Again, I start with the accretion of dust particles and planetesimals until uh, there is a core being formed. Uh, uh, and when the core mass is uh, large enough, it also starts to very slowly accrete gas. Uh, this is the beginning of, of, uh, of, of the formation of a giant planet in this uh, scenario is basically similar to terrestrial planets. Okay, so that's something we've heard about uh, yesterday. Uh, then there is further accretion of gas and solid, so the envelope grows uh, much, uh, much more slowly uh, at the beginning, but then the envelope starts to catch up with the solid's growth. And in the last stage, we have runaway gas accretion with relatively small accretion rate of solids. And there, this is when we really form the, the, the giant planet. Okay, so this is the last stage that the runaway gas accretion. Uh, and to know more about uh, this model, you can read a very nice review by D'Angelo et al. in Sarah Seger's uh, book. Okay, so uh, another thing I would like to say here is that in core accretion model, uh, it is assumed that the planetesimals uh, exist already, so we don't uh, get into the complexity of planetesimal formation. We let uh, um, Andres et al. Uh, do these things. Um, so the core accretion rate is given by this equation. Uh, so basically, um, dm dt solid, so this is the, the growth of the core, uh, depends on the capture radius of the planet. Uh, uh, which changes and, and growing as, as um, gas is, is uh, accumulated because of uh, gas drag. Uh, omega, that's the uh, orbital frequency. Sigma s, that's the solid surface density, and that's crucial here because the, the larger it is, the faster uh, the formation. Uh, is an FG, that's the gravitational enhancement factor, that sometimes can be very large, and that's very good because uh, we want to form the uh, planets fast enough before um, the hydrogen and helium disappear from the system. Okay, so as I said before, so uh, we start to uh, accumulate envelope at some point, that's when the core mass is high enough so it can attract some, uh, some gas, and it's slowly added to the planet until uh, the mass of the core is approximately the mass of the envelope, and then we reach the runaway gas accretion. This is the most famous, I would say, um, uh, plot of the core accretion model that's from Pollack et al. 96. Uh, and what you can see here, so this, are th this, this is the gas, these are the, these are the solids, and this is the total. So initially, there is very little gas being accreted, so it's mostly, mostly solids until isolation mass is reached, so this is basically when the feeding zone is depleted, uh, but slowly the, there is also an accumulation of, of, of gas, and once they become about the same in mass, okay, then we have very fast growth in, in gas, and, and we form a giant planet. Okay? So that, that's the uh, basic idea. From this simulation, in terms of composition, uh, we get a core mass of about uh, 10 Earth masses, uh, and uh, the total mass of heavy elements is around 16. Okay? Uh, but uh, in 96, uh, before we had strong constraints on, on, on formation timescales, you could see that the, um, that the time to form giant planets was relatively long. Um, and now with uh, these observations, we, we don't want it to be, to be that long, and there are updated uh, models that try to solve these uh, long formation timescales, and there are a few ideas. So one way to do that is by migration. Um, 
Here again, that's, that's the time, but in log scale, and th these are the masses. Uh, again, solids versus, uh, versus gas. And uh, what you should take from here is that there is a big difference in the formation time scale if you do in situ formation at 5 AU versus uh, uh, starting to form the planet at 8 AU, but, mi but migrating inwards, uh, like, like shown here. So you can see that you can form a, a, a giant planet much faster. And this is from Ali Beretal, and you can look at his papers, uh, which discuss uh, giant planet formation with migration. So that's another way to solve the long formation time scale. People often think that core accretion must be a slow process. This is not always the case. If you have migration, you can definitely speed it up uh, a lot. Uh, in this case, a migrating Jupiter actually has uh, much more heavy elements. This is because as it migrates, it can eat more planetesimals on the way. So you get a larger enrichment by a factor almost of almost two between the in situ formation uh, and, and migrating case. OK, another way to uh, decrease the formation time scale is by um, uh, taking into account uh, um, grain growth and settling. So this is from uh, Norm Mobschewitz et al. Um, so in this paper, they took different uh, sigma. Again, this is the solid surface density in the formation location of the giant planet. So you have three different sigmas. Uh, and you see that uh, this is, again, uh, the time. So you can form giant planets quite fast. This is 4 million years, uh, but even much faster than that, depending on sigma. But this is much faster than the Pollock et al. This is definitely within the life, lifetime of disks. OK? Uh, but another thing to note is that just by these different sigmas uh, and with this fast formation time scale, uh, we, we get very different, uh, we can get very different final compositions. If you look at the core masses, so here we have like 16 and around 7 and, and 4. So very different. So that's another thing. Core accretion does not necessarily lead to one type of composition or enrichment. This depends on, on the place where it's formed, and it can be quite, quite a large range. OK. So updated models um, progress since uh, uh, PP5. So uh, in the previous plot, for example, like this one, you can see that models stopped when gas accretion was reached. And then, then you said, OK, I formed a, a giant planet. But no one really investigated what is the final mass of the planet that you would form. You just said, OK, now it's very rapid, and I form a, 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 a giant, giant planet. But what is the final mass of this planet? Um, so these are uh, updated models they, they um, actually do. So they take into account uh, that the gas accretion at some point um, ends. So one way to, to stop it is basically you, you can say that then uh, it's, it's uh, it's because the, the gas disappears from the disk, so uh, that, that's what stops the accretion. But you can also say that uh, you have gap opening, and then uh, the accretion of gas is much less efficient, uh, and you reach a final uh, mass uh, for the planet. Uh, so this is from Lisa Wartal. Um, that too, and basically you can see that instead of this sharp, infinite uh, uh, type of uh, curve, you really reach, this is for Jupiter formation, so you really reach Jupiter mass. OK, so that, that's, that's a very nice uh, uh, development. Uh, and uh, Jana Liberatal, uh, they also um, simulate the formation of, of, of Jupiter and other giant planets, uh, accounting for migration, disk interaction, and also other planets uh, which compete, basically, uh, as the planets uh, want to grow. Uh, so I encourage you to look at that. So in terms of composition, although I said it already, uh, I would like you to um, take home this, this idea that the predicted composition of core accretion is not necessarily enriched. Okay? The planets are not necessarily metal rich. In fact, the metallicity of the planet can be smaller than the metallicity of the star. This, this was, uh, for example, in the, uh, in the plot I showed you with uh, sigma equals 4. Uh, for example, if you take Jupiter, so uh, a solar composition for Jupiter would have six uh, Earth masses. Uh, of heavy elements, and there we had only four. So in fact, this could be a, um, a, a metal-poor planet, 
formed by core accretion. Of course, the metallicity of the planet can be about uh, the metallicity uh, of the star. So again, Z planet can be smaller than Z star if the accreted gas is metal poor and the core mass is small, like uh, we've seen in this, uh, in this plot. Uh, it can be about the same metallicity, for example, if the accreted gas has stellar composition and core mass is small, or if the accreted gas is metal poor and the core mass is large. Uh, but it can, of course, also be enriched compared to the, uh, to the star. And this is when the accreted gas has stellar composition and core mass uh, is large, and or when there are many planetesimals being accreted at the late uh, stages of, uh, of gas accretion. And of course, there are many other options which I, I, I haven't listed here. But this is a very important point. There is not one direction of enrichment for, for this formation mechanism. Okay. Uh, so what about the predicted commas? Another thing is that um, in the 80s, uh, when, when people thought that uh, Jupiter's commas is about 10 or 20, so then uh, Pollock et al. picture uh, fit very well, but now when we think that maybe Jupiter's commas is 5 or maybe 0, so how does that fit? So I can tell you that um, core accretion does not necessarily predict large cores. Uh, first of all, uh, as, as you saw from the Movshevitz et al. plot, the core mass changed just for this specific model from 16 to 4, okay, just based on, on sigma, which is actually unknown. It, we don't really know the surface density of the disk. Um, and also, for simplicity, models typically assume that the uh, accreted planetesimals reach the core. This is in order to calculate uh, the luminosity and so on. But in fact, after the core reaches about two Earth masses, the planetesimals or the heavy elements will, will want to stay in the, in the envelope because of gas drag. So uh, the final core mass will be, can be much smaller than that, even if you accrete uh, many heavy elements. Uh, and last uh, idea is that even if the uh, initially, the core is very massive. Uh, there is very nice work recently, but that started already quite a few decades ago, that there is the possibility of core erosion. Don't forget, we want to form the planet within a few million years, but then we have 10 to the 9 years of evolution, and there is, uh, these planets are convective, and there are initial processes happening inside, and cores can, in principle, uh, get smaller and eroded with time. So if, even if you observe, for example, um, Jupiter, and we say, okay, the, ma the core mass is zero or two, it does not mean that, that it's not contradictive for starting with a core mass of 10 or 15. But that depends on the efficiency of core erosion, and this is a work in progress. Okay, so dependence on parameter in the core equation just to um, fit it to uh, exosolar uh, giant planets. Uh, so what about their position in the disk? Where is it the best or easiest uh, to form giant planets? So uh, around uh, one mass stars, uh, uh, an ideal formation location is between 5 and 10 AU. Um, what about stellar mass? Uh, this you, you've heard from Gilles. Uh, basically, if disk mass uh, scales with stellar mass, so then if we have more, uh, more massive disks, it's easier uh, to form giant planets. At some point, the disk lifetime is thought to decrease. So it's very ma around very massive stars, it will be a bit harder because the disk lifetime uh, will not be um, that long. Uh, what about stellar metallicity? So core accretion uh, fits very nicely with uh, the metallicity correlation because if the disk is more metal rich, it's easier to form the core, it can happen faster and in a more e efficient manner and uh, that naturally expands this, this correlation between uh, the occurrence rate of giant planets and stellar metallicity. Okay, so second model, disk instability. Uh, you've seen some of these uh, plots and, and equations, so I will uh, try to be quite quick. Okay, so the idea is that giant planets form uh, due to disk fragmentations. Uh, the formation time scale is usually uh, quite short, about 1,000 years, uh, and it uh, usually occurs at large radial. Uh, radii, and this is because the tumor parameter that you've just seen. Uh, so uh, Q can be smaller uh, around uh, either cold disk, very massive disk, and large radial distances. But I will uh, 
Uh, okay, I would like to mention here that there is an issue about the cooling of these fragments. This is a substantial uh, field of uh, investigation because even if you form these this fragments, they need to, to cool fast enough. Uh, but I must say that although uh, in the early 2000s uh, it was thought that you need uh, uh, beta or, or the cooling uh, factor to be rather small, uh, recent simulations show that beta crit, so the, the cooling time scale and also the cooling radius radius basically could be could be much larger and I encourage you to look at our paper and 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 learn about that okay so here I have uh, a movie that uh, this is not a real simulations it's a simulation by Aaron Bolly that was combined with some um, uh, artist view, but again, the idea of uh, disk instability, you have a disk, it starts to develop spiral alarms, and um, you could have uh, fragmentations, formation of clumps. Clumps can form uh, further out, but uh, very efficiently migrate inward. Some of them merge, some of them fall to the stars, but maybe some of them survive and develop uh, to become giant planets. So the disk instability, if you form this fragment, in principle, it would have three uh, stages of evolution. Uh, I will, um, so they are summarized here. Initially, they have the pre-collapse evolution stage. This is when the clump is very, uh, very large radii around uh, AU, very cold, so this is molecular hydrogen. Um, after some time, uh, and we, we don't really know the time scale because it depends on many physical uh, processes and uh, parameters. Um, we, we, we get dissociation of molecular hydrogen, and there is a collapse, and there, there is long-term evolution uh, of the planet, basically similar to, um, to the core accretion model. Um, and there are um, simulations of, of this evolution using 1D models, then we can add more physics to it, like um, uh, composition, metallicity, opacity, and so on. Uh, but this is 1D. Uh, but there are also people working on 3D simulations in which they account for the non-spherical shape uh, of, the, of the clumps and also for the angular momentum they have. Okay, what about the, because we, we discussed this um, metallicity correlation and the and giant planet occurrence rate, so what about the efficiency of disk instability and, and stellar metallicity? So uh, again, fragmentation depends on disk thermodynamics, uh, and this, this depends on the opacity uh, and mean molecular weight in the disk. Uh, I would say that this is still uh, debated. Uh, some groups say that there is more efficient fragmentation with reduced opacity, while other groups uh, uh, suggest that fragmentation is insensitive to opacity. So I, I hope that uh, in the next few years we will at least uh, be able to, 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 to answer this question. When is uh, disk instability more efficient? Uh, okay, but what about composition of disk instability planets? Just like in the core accretion model, the composition of disk instability uh, uh, giant planets can range from sub to superstellar. It, and and the, the reasoning is basically very similar. Um, so for disk instability planets, there are three uh, enrichment mechanisms that have been proposed. So one is enrichment from birth, and the, this is taken from Bolli et al. And the idea is that clumps tend to form around spiral arms, and in fact, um, solids tend to accumulate in these regions. So then if the clumps collapse, they would already, from birth, will be enriched with heavy elements compared to the star. So this is one way to, to uh, enrich the planet, although usually, according to their simulations, the enrichment cannot be by a factor of five, but usually between 1.5 and two. And this is yet to be investigated, I think, in more detail, but this is a very nice idea. Um, the other way to do that is by, is by planetesimal accretion. Uh, even if you form a, your clump with a stellar, stellar composition, there are planetesimals within these disks, and especially in the uh, pre-collapse evolution uh, stage, um, because the clump is so large and extended, it is quite easy to capture uh, those objects. Of course, it depends on their sizes, compositions, velocities, and so on, which we don't really know. But uh, we could show that uh, planets can, can get 
can become very much enriched. So they could even accrete 100 Earth masses of heavy elements, maybe also the 200 uh, Earth masses that Gilles pointed out. Of course, it depends on the uh, conditions in the disk, but this is feasible. It, 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 could, it could happen. Um, OK, another thing is, is the f uh, formation of a core. Let's say we do discover that most giant planets have cores, which is very challenging. But the point is that also disk instability planets can still have cores. And uh, again, there are three um, ways to do that. Uh, so one is enrichment from birth. Then the solids will be accumulated toward the center in the first place. Uh, the second way is to do is by grain settling. So in the initial stages, again, the clump is very cold and extended. So you still have solid grains, and they can uh, collide and grow and eventually become to the center. Uh, third way is, pl again, planetesimal accretion. If you accrete a planetesimal, it could go uh, all the way to the center. And what we don't know, uh, and this is actually true for both models, we don't know if most of the material tends to go to the core, or maybe we have a bit of a more smaller core and enriched envelope. And this depends on, on many things and also on the evolution of the planet, which uh, I'm not going to, to talk about. But I think this is very uh, interesting uh, direction of research to really understand where do the solids go. OK, uh, another idea, another way to enrich the planets in the disk instability scenario is by uh, gas removal. So we heard that these clumps can migrate inward, and at some point they can lose some of their envelopes. And if they manage to form a core during this, uh, b b during this migration time scale, uh, uh, the final product, so the final planet, will actually be enriched compared to the star. Um, so you ended up with an enriched uh, giant planet. Uh, so please uh, look at Bolly and Durison and uh, Sergei's paper, uh, which, which describe in very de detailed uh, this, this, this mechanism. OK, so to summarize uh, these two formation models, um, OK, so core accretion, so the strength. So it fits well to the physical properties of the solar system planets. Um, Good formation location at 5 AU for Jupiter, the most massive one. Um, failed giant planets for Uranus and Neptune. Uh, again, it, all, it, it can lead to a large variety of masses and compositions. And this is exactly what we see from extrasolar planets. There is a diversity. They can be metal rich, metal poor, or uh, with stellar composition. Uh, the core accretion model can explain both the metallicity correlations. One is the uh, occurrence rate with stellar metallicity, this, this correlation, and the correlation between heavy element mass and stellar metallicity. And they pred I mean, this model predicts no giant planets around low mass and metal poor stars. So, and, and we don't find that many giant planets around uh, low mass and metal poor stars. And the long formation time scale, which was often taken as a, as a weakness, can actually be solved by opacity reduction and or migration. But it also has weaknesses. Uh, the first is one type migration, which uh, we started to discuss uh, in, in, in the morning. So in fact, there is still an open question about the migration of these cores. So one has to make sure that they don't fall to the star. Although there are not that many um, giant planets observed around metal poor stars, they do exist. And this is very hard to form in the core accretion model. Uh, and the giant planets around at very large radial distances, we just heard that it, it is possible. But this is not very easy. So I will take it as a weakness. Uh, what about um, disk instability? So strength. Just like the core accretion, it can lead to a large variety of masses and composition. It forms planets very rapidly and efficiently. Uh, it can explain the, the giant planets at very large radial distances, and also the formation of giant planets around uh, metal poor stars. But it also has weaknesses. So we still have to ask, can realistic disks become gravitationally unstable? And even if fragmentation occurs, do they survive if they form? 
Uh, and it cannot naturally expand the correlation between planet occurrence and stellar metallicity. As I said, this is still debated, and I hope that we will know better uh, in the next uh, few years. Um, and let's say the final uh, weakness for people who like uh, unity, uh, it offers a different mechanism uh, for forming uh, terrestrial and, and giant planets. OK, but maybe we shouldn't debate that strongly because maybe they don't completely compete. As I think we are approaching this point, uh, disk instability might be more common during the early stages when the disks are more massive, uh, and core accretion could occur at later stages. Uh, disk instability could represent the first stages in planet formation, and that means that even if they don't, uh, uh, even if this mechanism does not lead to the formation of giant planets, it could have an important role in um, accumulating solids uh, and, and, and shaping the system in general, transferring angular momentum and so on. Uh, but even if, if it is successful, it does not mean that uh, um, giant planets cannot form later by core accretion. And this instability might be necessary. Uh, as we heard in the morning, uh, maybe it's not the dominant mechanism, but it might uh, be necessary to expand giant planet formation around metal pool stars and around M dwarfs, and maybe at very large radial distances. Uh, but overall, core accretion does seem to explain most of the properties of solar and exosolar uh, giant planets. OK, so um, my last slide, so this is looking forward. Uh, in our uh, chapter, we have actually a long discussion of what do we uh, think the theoretical models uh, should do in the uh, following years. Uh, so from theory, what we would really like to have is, unfortunately, more compl complex models, but that account for different physical processes in a self-consistent uh, manner. Um, and from the observational side, uh, I think we would all like to have uh, more constraints uh, on the solar system planets. I would definitely uh, like that from Juno, from Cassini Extended Extended Mission, and maybe future Uranus or Neptune mission. Um, and from the side of exoplanets, uh, I think it will be very important to discover uh, giant planets, maybe not transiting, maybe I should also have here uh, direct imaging of planets at larger radial distances. Uh, again, we want more complete studies, uh, and we want to be able to characterize exosolar giant planets, maybe include more uh, constraints on the internal structure, maybe like the love number, flattening, atmospheric composition, so we can constrain better the actual uh, internal structure and not just the mean density of the planet. Um, okay, so we hope that by the next chapter, PP7, we will really better understand planetary systems, not only um, our own solar systems, but by the ones that are, are being observed. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ravit. Uh, before we start the questions, we will have two announcements uh, before going to the coffee break, so don't rush to grab a coffee and wait for the announcement. Okay, so let's start here. Andrea from Caltech. Can you hear me? Okay, Andrea Zella from Caltech. So uh, I would like to make two comments related to disks. So we, we now have, both thanks to millimeter observation and extreme adaptive optics system, the evidence that uh, the most massive disks are uh, somehow unstable or there are some kind of instability. So we have spiral arms, uh, we see l very large cavities. And, and that's point toward uh, the idea that you may have formation of planet at uh, uh, 20 or even 50 astronomical units. Yes. So, so these are a rare object. I mean, the white separation planets are rare and also these large cavity disks are rare. So there's something to take into account in terms of disk instabilities. The other thing is that I, in, in the observation, so again, millimeter observation now are reaching the, the angular resolution that allow you also to probe the formation of planet. And that is much better than just extrapolating back in time for mi yes. billion years. So, so that's another point that in the next uh, five years will give you direct constraint where right. planet forms. Yeah, we are waiting for that. Of course, we would love to see that, yeah. Okay, Alessandro? 
Yes, your outline on the core accretion model is probably correct in the general lines, but I think it's fair to say to this audience that there are big problems that are unsolved, and mainly two, I think. The first is on the growth of the core. It's not that obvious how the core grows. There are issues with planetesimal scattering, shepherding, which are totally unsolved. That's why we are so excited about pebble accretion, but that right. needs to be studied further. And the second one is the terminal mass of the planet. So saying that the planet opens a gap and stops accreting, it's a legend, in fact. It may right. work for 10 Jupiter masses, but it doesn't work for one Jupiter mass. In the poster up here by Zulaki et al., we argue maybe the circumplanetary disk has an important role. I don't know if this is true or not, but it's definitely a big problem that the community should try to solve. Yes, I agree. So uh, none of the models is, is complete. And they are, I mean, as time progresses, it actually seems more and more challenging to form uh, giant planets. And uh, yes, in our chapter, we do address all these uh, difficulties, I think, in quite a, an equal and fair way for both formation scenarios. Okay. Uh, Roman Rafikov, uh, Princeton. I have a comment uh, uh, regarding the subsequent uh, planetesimal accretion by either uh, planets formed by GI or f planets formed by CI as well. Uh, so I think that uh, in Take in, in considering this process, one has to take into account some subtle processes. For example, uh, this uh, giant planet will be exciting its planetesimal population yes. to very high velocity dispersions, which will reduce gravitational focusing and reduce uh, accretion cross-section. And second thing, as shown by Hidekatsu Tanaka and Shigeru in uh, 96 and 97, uh, the planet will tend to open gap in this planetesimal population, which will further reduce the accretion uh, rate of uh, this planetesimal. So there are still some open issues, which in my opinion, will only work to reduce the amount of subsequent planetesimal accretion. Okay, that that's answers uh, Moby's point for that nicely, somehow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the bit. back, yeah. Uh, Duncan Forgan, University of Edinburgh. Uh, I'd just like to make a comment on the uh, critical cooling time for disk fragmentation and some of the recent results that suggest this could be quite high. Uh, at least in the case of SPH simulations, it seems to be the case that if you look at the way the cooling function was implemented, it actually wasn't implemented correctly and that, in fact, all the groups doing this were guilty of this. So we've gone back and correctly implemented the cooling, and we find now that the critical cooling time doesn't go to very large values, and, in fact, converges at much lower values. So at least in the case of SPH, we feel this might be solved. Yes, I think, I think the cooling uh, efficiency and time scale uh, is really now the, the, the uh, topic that, that people should concentrate on, because I think that once we, uh, we are able to, to pass this stage, uh, everything seems to be possible. Yeah. Okay, up there. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I think uh, for the people who uh, have still are still not convinced that core accretion is important for plant formation, Coro has to offer two nice uh, reference examples upon the many that are interesting for plant formation. I think one is Coro Seven, which shows that. You can grow a six Earth mass core, even in difficult places. And the other one, for the people who are still in doubt that it's difficult to make cores uh, in, the, uh, in the disk instability framework, uh, is Coro 20, which uh, is offering a core of a Jupiter mass or more. So it's a giant planet, which is mostly core, and I think this is a real challenge for any modeling of planet formation. Yes, so uh, both of these, these planets, Core 7 and Core 20, are not easy to explain in both formation uh, models. And yes, monsters exist, and you know there are different ways to explain it, and maybe this simple picture is not enough. Maybe we need collisions, gas removal, and so on. But this is uh, a, a very uh, actually important point to note that one way is to think about a general formation mechanism for giant planets, and the second thing is to explain a specific object. So of course, when you go to this resolution, you have to, to include many more uh, feasible History, you know, history passes and, and, and physical mechanisms. Okay, let's come back here. Rob? Uh, Rob, Rob Jeffries. Uh, I'd just like to reiterate a point that I made in my talk on Tuesday, which is these observational timescales for the presence of gas are entirely dependent on the ages that are assumed or estimated for young clusters. So these have systematic uncertainties of at least a factor of two. Okay. And even aside from that, the most recent work by, for example, 
Bell et al., Mamajek and Pico, suggests that some of the key objects, the key clusters that determine that time scale, are maybe a factor of two older. So it may well be that the half-life of the gas is actually more like four million years, not two million years. Okay, thank you. Okay, I this side. Uh, Nicole Cabrera, I'm from GSU and EPEG, uh, and I was wondering if you could clear something up. Uh, so yesterday's talk, the models seemed to show that the giant planets migrating seemed to just move around the planetesimals, but not actually accrete so many. Uh, but in this talk, you mentioned that this could actually um, help reduce the um, formation time scale by a factor of two. So I was wondering, what impact does it actually have uh, on the mass accretion for these giant planets? So. I, I think the efficiency of, of uh, solid accretion during the early stages of uh, planet formation in core accretion uh, is not well known. So there are different groups, and uh, each of them has quite different um, um, ideas of, of the, this, the efficiency of this process. And, and this is why we, we have a factor of two uncertainty in the final composition, even starting with the same initial conditions uh, of the disk. So I, 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 I think we don't really know, but this is something that people are looking at, at as we speak. Modukai? Hi. 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 That's better. Hi. <laughs> Where? Mordecai Maclow. Okay, yes. Hi. AM and H. Um, so you mentioned type 1 migration as being a danger for cores. Um, so in the last uh, several years, Parta Cooper has shown that type 1 migration in non-locally isothermal disks can actually have uh, even its sign change depending on the thermodynamic Absolutely. conditions. Uh, Vlad Lyra and I and our collaborators have shown that if you put plan uh, pl uh, planet planetary embryos into uh, such a, a realistic disk with realistic uh, thermal conditions, they will tend to move towards um, stable uh, orbits and collide there, which may be a very fast core formation mechanism. And at the very least, if you do have cores, they'll tend to end up in those stable orbits rather than in the star. OK, thanks. So that's very good. Of course, we, we would like to get rid of this, this problem. <laughs> OK, let's try to be brief here. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi, Ravid. Um, hey. So as you mentioned up here, uh, there's a lot of work being put into trying to characterize the atmospheres of extrasolar planets. So maybe this is a question for the afternoon session, but given all of the uncertainties in what you've just described, is there any hope to learn anything about planet formation and evolution from studying the atmospheres of exoplanets? Oh, that's a tough question, and it, it really depends who you ask. I'm actually relatively negative uh, in this respect because I take Jupiter and I say, well, let's say we knew certain things on its atmosphere, would it tell us something about the internal structure and formation mechanism? And I think not easily, uh, but and yet I think it's more information. So it's. Even if it doesn't tell us directly how the planets were formed, it could tell us about you know, mixing, convection, uh, bulk composition, and, and, and so on. So, so I think, yes, we want to go this direction. Are we going to have a, a robust answer very shortly after that? Probably not. But it will definitely add uh, our, I mean, it will increase our knowledge. So. OK, uh, Ralph? Yes. Um, the coupling between the final composition of a planet is going to be very intimately tied to the structure of the disk, particularly the trapping points that we heard about in last day's talks, uh, that material will gather at planet traps and all these things that Johansson actually reviewed are very important places. And I wondered your reaction about this fact that you're actually sniffing out the properties of disks at these particular important places. Uh, I think the, I mean, my answer is that we, we, reali I mean, we realize that, and I think uh, what we plan to do in the future is really to, to couple those two. So to have a self-consistent uh, formation model, but with disk evolution and you know, follow what happens to the solid, gap formation, maybe migration, and so on. But this is, of course, very challenging. But I think that's the future. OK, so we'll have our last question. Sorry for the rest. In Kevin? one of the slides, you show HR8799b to have eight Jupiter masses. This is assuming that it's a solar metallicity and you have certain preconceived ideas about atmospheres. But if you relax that and you just let the abundances roam, you end up with a small radius, a high surface gravity, super solar metallicities, non-solar abundances, 
and a mass of 16 plus minus 4 Jupiter masses. I understand that it's one of these monsters, but maybe monsters are extreme examples no, but, of planet formation. Okay. I would like to hear your view on it. So I think both formation models can actually explain that. So core accretion can, in principle, explain such a thing. But also disk instability can, because if you have this high mass uh, at early stages, uh, and because of the uh, large gravity of the planet, it will be very efficient to accrete planetesimals. So you could, in principle, in principle get this enrichment. Uh, and another thing is, is which is related to a previous question. Uh, when we, you look at the upper atmosphere, uh, one has to think, can we really use it uh, to extrapolate or to, to know what, what's inside? But uh, I, I think, again, I mean, the, the, the point is in this, as, as models become more and more complex, it's to some extent easier to explain things, right? And that's why both formation models could, could in principle, be consistent with that. But I, I think it is something that we need to, to take into account. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So please stay for the announcement.